Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending upon where you are in the world during this KT Global Webinar. My name is Sam Bernstein, and I'm a principal here at Kepler Trigo. We're a management consulting firm located in Princeton, New Jersey. I'd like to thank you all for attending this webinar with our title being Structure Your Frontline Workforce to Drive Continuous Improvement. Before we dive into the presentation, just a few housekeeping items that I wanted to share with you. Uh, you'll see on your screen uh, the team of Joel Beeshold and myself. Joel and I would love to engage with you and really entertain your questions today. To do this, please simply submit your question using the Ask a Question button located on the hand side of the player. We will address your inquiries during the Q&A period of the presentation. We may be able to take some questions during the presentation, but many of the questions we may hold until near the end of the presentation. Next, we want to know if you really found this use of time today to be of value to you. So at the end, we would ask that you please take a moment to rate this session by clicking on the Rate This button on the right-hand side of the player. Finally, we wanted you to know there's a recorded version of this presentation, which is going to be made available to you immediately following this, the event today. Please feel free to share this using the social buttons above your console. We will send you a version through email that might also be easier to share with your colleagues. Today, our session will be led by my friend and colleague, Joel Beeshold, former Vice President of Operations at Johnson Controls and Young Fung Automotive. So I'd like to thank you in advance for spending your time with us this afternoon for the next 60 minutes. And I'll now turn things over to my very capable friend, Joel Beeshold. Joel? Thank you, Sam. Hello, everyone. Uh, appreciate the invite, Sam. A couple uh, weeks ago, Sam asked me if I would uh, just entertain a webinar and uh, kind of talk about how we launched our HPTs and um, what we did. So uh, today, I'm just going to share that with you and obviously open for questions and uh, hopefully give you some insights. Uh, probably not everything will be earth shattering, but uh, at least I think you'll get some uh, some good insights here. So uh, slide one, uh, we're going to talk about the frontline team. Um, obviously, in manufacturing, the CI team is always looking to improve their performance. Um, but I think most of us know online the CI team has their hands full with many, many cases of improvement and issues in the plant. And there isn't usually enough bandwidth to get everything done. Uh, so they need to rely on other resources uh, to help get some of that done. And uh, I've you utilize the frontline team, the, the direct laborers on the line, and uh, that is a great resource to us. And uh, in many cases, I witnessed that it was only the tip of the iceberg, if you will, on what they can contribute. And uh, so the CI team um, in our company and now in other companies that I work for uh, and work with, we are tapping the talents of the front line. And um, I think it's uh, quite astounding uh, how much power they have, and it's usually hidden. Uh, it's probably like inventory a little bit, right? It's below the water line. So uh, with that, uh, I'm going to continue. So, you know, how do I define a high-performance team? Um, it is really defined by a group of people with specific roles, uh, and, and, you know, they usually have many different types of talents and skills, and they're aligned to commit uh, to putting parts together in manufacturing uh, to make a high quality product. And uh, I came from the automotive industry and uh, you know, the team is already together. Um, but many times I found that they were not given the name of high performance or even empowered many times or a pathway that wasn't even constructed for the team to contribute and to help uh, in some of the, maybe some of the bigger issues that uh, the line has faced. So simply put, the team is responsible for the improvements on their line, and uh, they're empowered to handle most of the issues that arise, and really that's what a high-performance team is, is when they're empowered to handle their own issues and take control with their 
team leader in many cases as uh, their main leader at the front line. And we're going to talk about problem solving and we're going to talk about leadership and how we can empower them more. Uh, you know, as I said, many times the team, the frontline team, is already participating in improvement events. Uh, I think a lot of you on the phone are probably thinking, hey, they're involved in Kaizen events, they're involved in 5S, they're involved in safety. Um, but how do we get them to take maybe even a greater lead and work on other issues? And, you know, it's one thing to say that they're empowered, but it's quite another, another to actually give them the tools, equip them with the right tools, and exercise and practice that empowerment. And it was surprising to me, and it still is today, as I'm working with a, a couple other uh, manufacturing plants, that teams really don't even know what an A3 is. They never heard of an A3. They never heard of what an 8D is. They don't know the steps of an 8D. Um, they can't even recite some of the 8Ds. Uh, they don't know what bobs and wows are, you know, like best of the best, worst of the worst. They they really don't understand is and is not. They understand the is, but they don't really understand the is not. Um, and there's many common terms and tools in manufacturing that, you know, we haven't shared with the frontline team. And uh, I found great uh, advantages to working with the frontline team and gathering some of their talent. But one thing you'll quickly hear uh, was, you know, why should I do this? You know, I'm already putting parts together. Uh, what comes out is what's in it for me. And I think as us on the phone, we got to talk about, you know, clearly articulating that. What is it, you know, what is in it for them as we engage them? Uh, you know, high performance engine is high performance. Why? Because that engine is designed to win races. And it's the same for the team. High performance team wins. How do we win? And what does that winning mean to me? And I want to uh, capture some of that uh, today. So at the core, the team needs to be recognized, but it needs to be measurable. And, uh, you know, it can't just, oh, great job. Great job for what? It's like the needle has moved, and here's examples. And I really, I found in, in you know, my experience in the last 25 years uh, in automotive manufacturing that the humans really on the floor need to feel their self-worth. I need to feel my self-worth. And it, it's amazing to me, it doesn't have to be overcomplicated. Um, you know, what questions do you reward your team with, or excuse me, what do you reward your teams with or individuals for? Is it for ideas? Is it for performance? Is it exceeding the goal? How do they feel that they're worthy every day? Uh, you know, is the goal board, does it have stars on it when they exceed their goal, et cetera? But keep in mind, these goals have to be measurable they have to be like a smart goal, right? Specific, measurable, achievable, you know, realistic, time-bound, things like that. It, it has to be uh, rolled up in a process. And otherwise, the teams are not going to feel that they're gaining, they're learning anything. And that really leads to my next slide here. What should we train our high-performance teams on? And, you know, more importantly, what do they need? If you're really trying to help people in your plant, frontline teams, you know, let's, let's not just give an opinion. Let's look at what other companies that have done research feel and know in surveys and, you know, investigations know what frontline teams need, what are employers looking for. And, in, and you can go back to 2010, 2005, but I looked at 2015 when we kind of kicked a lot of this off you see that the number one skill that employers are looking for, uh, according to, you know, this economic forum, global economic forum, it is problem solving. And you can see the rest on the list. You see some things that have dropped off, like quality control, et cetera. But when you look, problem solving is number one, and it will be number one in 2020 as well. And along with that, Critical thinking has taken a, a big leap uh, up onto the chart. And so employers are looking for people that can ask the questions, um, that can solve problems, that are creative, that can offer up our ideas. And so, it, uh, you know, we have a, the vast majority of our folks are on the line, and we form teams. 
and we were able to teach them a skill that they will truly need, they will truly use, and that is articulating what's in it for them, you're going to be a better problem solver, and that's not only going to help you professionally, but it's going to help you personally as well. And then, of course, I always look at Toyota. Um, we use a lot of Toyota production system, of course. And uh, when you look at the, the 4P model from Toyota, uh, right, at, right you know, at the partners, you know, they want to build exceptional individuals in teams. And that's, you know, it's not just the office teams. It's not the engineering team. It, uh, it is the teams on the floor as well. And then when you come to the top of the pyramid, what's at the top? Problem solving. And, you know, getting on the floor, when you see Gambitsu, you know, going to the source, uh, go to the source, view the problem, solve the problem, use a process like Kaizen, problem solving, and solve the problems, and that builds exceptional individuals. And that's the partnership. So using Toyota model, uh, we try to use that same model. When you look at um, the team and where they are, already positioned, uh, don't overlook the fact that these teams are already immersed in the day-to-day -day issues. I think a lot of us know that in many cases, uh, Murphy's Law exists in manufacturing. If someone can put a part on the wrong way or someone can forget something, Murphy's Law will raise its ugly head. The teams know this. They understand the pressures of automotive. They understand the day-to-day, -day, let's go, let's put the parts together. You know, we got to get these parts out. We got to satisfy the customer. They know what happens uh, when there's an issue, and many times uh, it's it's somewhat of the same thing. They feel like, oh, here's another issue, another quality alert, another paint marker that I have to put on a specific part. It's another check here, another check there. Uh, it's another containment company that is going to get in their way, and they could, you know, really represent a loss to their bonus and even their position. And so the teams, they realize that they want to have no issues as well, but they want to participate in how can I help. And, and many of the people on the line already take the initiative to raise their hand and say, hey, can I help? Uh, give me the opportunity. I'm willing to share my knowledge. I'm willing to, to share with you what's, what's working, what's not. And they need an avenue to do that, whether it's a, a, you know, a goal board or whether it's an idea board or whether it's a suggestion system. The teams are looking for that opportunity. You'll be surprised uh, how many teams are looking for that ability uh, to share, and they want to share their, their value that they provide. It's, it's more than just putting parts together in exchange for, for money. They want to put parts together. They want to do a good job. They want to be recognized for a job well done. And uh, for me, that's that's very critical and very important. So, so I think we have a little poll coming up, Sam. Yes, uh, I'm going to move to the next slide, and um, I'll, 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 I'll try to get this poll up for you folks right now. You'll see there's uh, one of five choices. The question is, how do you reward your front line for a job well done? And you can see you have five responses that you can select uh, from any one of those five. And what we're going to do is provide you with an opportunity um, to deal with the uh, voting right now as an audience. And I'm going to uh, line this up so that um, you can start to vote right now, selecting uh, one, two, three, four, five, and we'll be able to see as you vote um, over the next uh, minute, we're taking about 60 seconds to do this, we'll start to see the percentages of what numbers you selected for your response. We have about 30 seconds left if you haven't had a chance to vote yet. Okay, and, and Joel, uh, I think you're seeing these, but the final tallies for the audience are, uh, how do you reward your frontline for a job well done? 
36% of our participants today, actually it's been updated, 41% of our participants today chose one, handouts, gifts, or gift cards. Uh, 20% chose company recognition, 13% an award program, 10% outings or events, and uh, 13% actually been modified again, uh, 19% said nothing. So uh, the final tally is 38% for one, 23% for two, 14% for three, 7% for four, 16% for five being nothing. So Joel, I'll, I'll turn that back over to you and you can proceed or, or you might even wanna make a comment on those percentages. Yeah, thanks, Sam, and uh, thanks, everyone, for clicking uh, on the voting. Um, I think handouts and gifts, uh, I kind of had in the back of my mind that one may win. I think it's fairly easy to do. Um, we've, I've even done it in the last couple days. Um, it's, it's fairly quick, and, uh, you know, it is meaningful because people get a gift card, and, and it's, it's real tangible. Um, I think our company, uh, you know, we started to do some company recognition, and, uh, you know, get people up in front. I think that's very good. Um, award programs are like if, if they achieve so much or they do so good, they start to get, you know, internal trophies, company trophies. Uh, I think outings and events are always good. I think the one that's a little concerning is the nothing. Hopefully some of that is, uh, you know, maybe more sarcastic than anything else. But, um, yeah, I think, uh, you know, doing nothing, uh, maybe I should have put on there a number six, like, um, you know, the, the, you know, the verbal recognition, which I kind of thought that was in the company recognition, but it, maybe it could have been a little more specific, you know, walking out, thanking the team for a job well done. But, um, yeah, I think it's important. People do want to feel valued and, uh, the thank you and the gift card, uh, goes a long ways. Thanks, Sam. Thanks everyone. I'm going to continue now. Um, as we, as we talk a little bit about a commitment, um, I put a joke up here that I think uh, probably most of us have heard. You know, the the chicken and the pig, they're talking about opening a restaurant, and the chicken's going to provide the eggs, and, uh, you know, the the pig would provide the bacon. Obviously, one is, is more committed, uh, you know. So we have to talk about our team's committed, because if they're committed and they have skin in the game, if you will, then they, you know, they're they're willing to participate they're willing to get involved. They're willing to do homework, takes on assignments. And uh, at our company, at Johns Controls and Yen Fung, we opened KT training up to the shop floor audience. It wasn't, it was no longer, let's say, restricted to just the engineers, just the office. Um, and what we did is we led uh, events, trainings with those that desire to participate and what I what I really mean by commitment is I I provided the training and along with some of my colleagues and it was during their lunch, so the the people that were coming to the training the front line they were not getting paid for it they were giving up their lunch to learn uh, I was I was not providing pizza I was not providing you know burgers or hot dogs etc. They brought their own brown bag. They sat in the room, and we used their time uh, to train. And you'd be surprised how many showed up. Matter of fact, the, the, in many cases, it was only standing room only. Um, and there was there was a desire to climb the corporate ladder, obviously to get paid more, but to take on more responsibility. And they, many of them, were looking for avenues. How can I do that? They wanted additional training. In many cases, they weren't sure they could afford additional training. So this was free training for them. It was during their lunch. There was a commitment. Uh, there was homework, et cetera. And so the evolution was training in many areas for our high-performance high teams. You know, there was leadership training and, you know, other skilled training, thinking training, uh, leadership training. But problem solving was really the one that I focused on. And it was based upon the World Economic Forum data. So... I led the teams uh, through problem solving and critical thinking training, and KT was the basically the foundation for that. Um, Joel, so Joel, I'm gonna, Joel, yeah. Joel, pardon me one minute. I apologize for interrupting, but if I yeah, may, yeah. two questions came in that I wanted to clarify. 
Uh, one, uh, the poll that you just did, you'll be happy to hear this. Someone uh, said that in their organization, they actually do all four choices. So they provide handouts, gifts, or gift cards. They do company recognition. They do award program, and they do uh, outages, outage or event activities. So um, I think that's great that somebody in one organization at least does all four of those and suggested maybe in the future we could have an all of the above category for them to select from. And then one other person simply asked, because they got on a little bit late, if this presentation will be made available after today. And yes, as long as we have your name and email, we will send you an audio of this presentation as well as the PowerPoint. So Joel, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I'll turn things back over to you. Thanks, Sam. No, that's very good. I think, um, yeah, maybe the, you know, the, the all of the above is, is good as well. I think uh, for people on the line, um, you know, it, it is an inward focus. You know, what are we focusing on to reward our team members with? What should we be rewarding them with? Um, it, and I don't think this list is, is complete as well. I think there's probably many other ways uh, to, ro to reward teams, teams on the floor and uh, develop them into high-performance teams. But it was, it was a little bit of a thought starter. And, uh, yeah, I appreciate the... The, the people that are and the companies that are going above and beyond, they kind of maybe have it organized that you start with an attaboy and then you give a gift card and then you have some company recognition and, you know, get them up on stage and then maybe you, you take them on an outing, et cetera. And maybe there's a way to build that in. Uh, so thanks, Sam. Um, the next, really the next slides are kind of the bulk of it. Um, I kind of set the stage on our high performance teams, but where do you start? And, um, of course, you need the commitment, and, uh, you know, I, I already mentioned that, you know, I provided these trainings, and I'm still providing these trainings to the teams. There's, you know, it's it's for them to give up their time and learn something. I have even done these on off shifts. I've done them, you know, at night. Uh, I, and I feel that there's a, a real need for people to, you know, get involved, but if you're paying them to to be in the training, uh, I'm not so sure that they're committed. It's, it's maybe just an easier work that they're doing. So we, uh, in my role, I never actually, uh, we always did it on their off time. So where did I start? Number one, I started with, you know, a big board. Um, we needed a place to communicate. Um, we needed a place to, to label, you know, really separation, team members' names, what they were responsible for. Uh, I've seen complex rollouts. I'm not going to mention any companies' names, but, you know, I've seen beautiful graphics. I've seen divisions divided up into star points. So, you know, there was someone at the center of the star, and they had all these, you know, points around the star, quality star point. They had a manufacturing star point. They had a you know, problem-solving star point. You can imagine some of these stars could go, you know, pretty large. Um, but the the reason, you know, it, you have a board is you start to, to create leads and you start to offer up uh, leads and people will take leadership. Um, you know, and this board is also a way to communicate who's doing what by when. It's like a little bit like a project management board. And you'll be surprised how many people raise their hand and say, I'll take that problem. I'll take that issue. I'll take, you know, that task. And um, I think it's very important, start with a big board, start with a communication board. I used a whiteboard, and we just started to draw on the whiteboard, and it was very easy to morph, very easy to change. Small teams with a big board, uh, and along with the extra training, it goes a long way. So that's really the, the number one is uh, communication and start with the big board. Number two, and I have an example here, but actually a couple examples. Number two was keep it simple, at least at first. Um, you know, I'm not that musical, but, you know, you can see Mozart in the upper left. It's like that, if I was a, a, a student learning, uh, you know, you got treble clef and bass clef and you got all these notes and it's like, yeah, that's, that's pretty complex. How do I start? Or do I start with, you know, like the Mary had a little lamb on the side? And uh, that may be a little bit easier for me. So my example is very similar because I know we've taught 
people 5S before, but if you ask people, what are the five Japanese words again? And, you know, most people are like, I don't know, you know, but, but then you even ask them, what are the five English S's, you know, and, and I, I have them listed here, but, you know, a lot of people may not even know what the five S's are. Do you, do you really expect people to learn the five S's or do you expect them to learn the process of the five S's? And give them a help to help them, you know, give them an aid to help them learn, and then they can go out and do it. And um, so we use, and I use this example because it's fairly straightforward. And uh, so 5S, I I boil it down to three no's. When you walk out onto your line, you can action things this way. The first is there's no unnecessary stuff on your line. So when you walk there, it's like, there's, is there anything I don't need or is it all necessary? Is all this inventory necessary? No, probably not all the inventory. Is, is this machine necessary? Is this tool necessary to be here all the time? Is, are all these boxes necessary? And people can quickly understand. They can, they can action that. And, you know, I know 5S has a red tag to even help with this, you know, uh, as you go across shifts. But now you can see it's like, hey, is there no unnecessary stuff. I try to teach this to my kids. Look at your room. Is there anything unnecessary here, you know? The next one is no mess. And clearly, you know, you want things organized. You want tool boards. You want a you know, place for everything and everything that's placed. Obviously, it's, it's that simple, right? You walk up. There's nothing unnecessary. Everything in its place. There's no mess. I can action that. And then the last one is no dirt. I don't want to have dirt. I want this place to be clean. Even antiques look beautiful when they're, you know, all shined up. It doesn't matter how old the equipment is. They're painted nice. They're touched up nice. There's no oil leaking, et cetera. There's no dirt, no grease, no grime, nothing. And and the teams can action that. And, uh, you know, that's all they need to know with 5S. And then, you know, well, how do you get them to learn the, the other 5Ss or the other parts of the 5S? Well, what if we did these three no's every day? What if you did it every time you walked up to your line and, you know, you standardize that? And, you know, what if we did it at the end of the shift and, uh, you know, let's say five minutes of 5S every day and all of a sudden they're sustaining it and, you know, it goes longer term. It's starting to spread throughout the plant. Next thing you know, of course they know 5S. It's really three no's. It's that simple. How do you take that concept, right, and then go deeper? And and so really on the 5S, uh, I like to take, you know, go deeper when I talk about, you know, walking through your line, you're, you're now understanding there's nothing unnecessary, everything's in its place, you've cleaned everything, and why, by the way, while you're cleaning, you know, are, are there any bolts loose, are there any wires loose, uh, is there anything out of place that, you know, that looks you know, like it's wearing out, you see some little shavings coming off of something, right? And that cleaning is really inspection, that inspection is detection, and that detection is correction before it help, you know, before it really turns into a problem. And that's, now you're taking the team to a whole new level on 5S. And that's the same thing with problem solving. What questions do they need to ask? How do you funnel those down? And so, yeah, you know, that's what I wanted to, you know, really hit of problem solving. Number three is teach them problem solving. So, yes, it's going to start off simple, but it's going to get more complex and they're going to grow with it. I chose Kepner Trago for, for many reasons. Um, they've been around for 60 years, Ben and Chuck, you know, when they started this uh, in 1958. But even Apollo 13, and everyone's familiar with, you know, Houston, we've got a problem, you know. Everyone's familiar with Apollo 13, but many people are not familiar with NASA accredits the Kepner Trago, you know, problem solving, decision making, critical thinking training that they had, which really attributes to bringing those astronauts back safely. And so to me, I think it's very important because 60 years, how do you train people to become better critical thinkers? I even, you know, when I think about my kids and my family, it's like, you know, what, how are they learning problem solving? In the old days, when I, you know, everyone was a farmer, you had to solve problems. Nowadays, there's less and less farmers, so no one's getting that really that hands-on experience that I had. And how do you train that? And uh, you'd be surprised how many people want that type of training.
Um, let me go back a slide here because it looks like one popped by too quick. Uh, slide 18, here's some questions that really surround what we're training. Um, you know, people want to know from a global standpoint, where do I start? They ask that question, what, yeah, what should I work on first? And, and you know, another one is, you know, why did that happen? We shipped a thousand good parts and one of them's bad. Why did that happen? Another one is, you know, uh, which one really hits home a lot of times is, wh you know, where should we go on vacation? What car should I buy? What's the best computer for me? You know, which is best for me? It's like, how do you, how do you answer that, those questions? How do you analyze those questions quickly and, and appropriately and, and to the right depth? And then a lot of my favorites involve, like, future, what if? You know, what if we did this? You know, or, or what if uh, we put this in place? You know, would we eat like kings or, you know, would we make a million dollars or, man, we would never have this problem again if only we did this. And you get people thinking about these questions and then how can they action those questions? Kind of like on 5S, you've got to keep it simple. It's like, really, there's only, you know, four or five questions here. And, you know, how can you help people with that? Uh, I think an advantage that we had, we had continuous improvement. Uh, we had it already divided up into some structure. We had lean, which to me, you know, that's the removal of waste. We had Six Sigma, which is, you know, for most part, removal of common cause, right, the common cause variations. And then Kepner Traga we had for the removal of special cause. And then we had this whole overlooking critical thinking, prioritized and, and looking for resources, uh, you know, how can Kepner Trago help us? So. For us, it was perfectly aligned to our continuous improvement program. We already had it. I think for folks on the phone, if you don't have, a, you know, let's say a clearly defined program, um, this is probably a good place to start. Um, you know, Lean, Sigma, KT, problem solving, things like that. That's, you know, that's at the core of continuous improvement. Uh, I clicked it. Let's see if it moves on. Slide number 20. Okay. Slide number 20, um, number four really is you need to teach them process. Now, they know process, but the process they know is putting parts together. They know they load these parts, they press this, this thing, this machine comes over and welds them and melts the steel, or they know that this heats up and pushes it together, or this one does this. They know process. How do you take that simply and just relate it to a thinking process? And so we kind of review this right in the beginning. You, you start with your information. You use your experience. You, you have judgment. You the knowledge that you gain. What do you need as inputs? And then how do you sort it and gather it, organize and analyze and confirm those inputs? And in the end, you want to have your concern, whether it's a, a decision made, a problem solved, a future issue protected for, uh, that's the output. And, and once people learn that thinking is a process and they can become better thinkers by having a better process, it's just like in manufacturing. The better process turns out better product. But you need, obviously, good inputs. You need a good, uh, you know, process to get a good output. And so we teach them this rational thinking process. I guess here's the uh, maybe a, a plug for Captain Trago. You know, Ben and Chuck, when they wrote their first book, they, they wrote The Rational Manager. You know, it's sometimes it's hard to even describe what a rational manager is. And uh, I even had, you know, my daughter ask me that same thing, uh, you know. But I, I couldn't really describe exactly, but I gave her an example of something that was irrational. And she said, well, that's irrational. And I said, yeah, now would you like to do something that's rational? And that's when I kind of introduced the, the rational thinking and the KT to them. And I would recommend people read that book, What is Rational Thinking? And, um, you you know, obviously the high-performance teams, we use that as well. Joel, Joel so, excuse me. Could you yeah. go back two slides just for a moment? One of the sure. questions uh, came up would be the next slide right there. Um, if you could talk a little bit more about the distinction between Six Sigma and Common Cause, and how your organizations use KT with special costs. Sure. I think uh, it's, a, it's a good, um, you almost need an analogy, but let me put it this way. 
many companies have a scrap percentage, right? Molding may have a 0.4% scrap, you know, or, you know, at the end of the day, you have so, so many scrap, you divide by how many parts you made. And at the end of the day, you have, you know, 2% scrap, 3% scrap. It's costing me this much money. Um, you know, new launches. I've been in new launches that had, you know, 13, 10, 13% scrap. And, uh, you know, so scrap rate is a, it's like, well, what's it, what's causing the scrap? Well, in many cases, uh, you know, if, if Y, think of a formula, Y equals some type of X, right? If Y is the scrap rate, what X's, X1, X2, X3, all these X's add up to give me the 5%. And Six Sigma bases its philosophy uh, on we can improve those X's. In many cases, the relevant X's, you do DOEs to find out which X's affect the most. And, um, you know, I, sometimes I even use the example, if I wanted you to cut wood, you know, 16 inches long, I give you a pencil, a saw, a tape measure, you know, I give you food and drink, I give you a break, I give you, you know, a sawhorse, and at the end of the day, I measure the wood, and some are measured, you know, some are, you know, the right size and some aren't. What caused them to be oversized and undersized? I don't know. Well, what, you know, let's understand the variation in each one of those X's, and that's really what Six Sigma is. They're like, there's a lot of common causes that, attribute to a low, you know, a scrap rate, um, whereas KT or, you know, uh, special cause, when you're attacking special cause, you know, you have a machine, it, it, it welds parts, uh, or you have people that put parts together and, you know, they ship a thousand parts and 999 are, all the bolts are tight, all the things are together, right? And, you know, and it, all of a sudden it's like, hey, we got, the customer calls up, we got one that's loose or we got one that's scratched, or we got one that's mislabeled. It's like, wow, how did that happen? And and so we usually use KT for those very special causes. Six Sigma we use causes. Although, if you think about it, if you really drill down on one particular X, uh, you could probably treat that as a special cause and, um, you know, maybe, uh, you know, eliminate that one X. But Six Sigma is generally around the variation of your whole process. Six Sigma is around maybe specific special parts. Um, so I think that's pretty good for now, Sam. Yeah, thank you, Joel. I just wanted that addressed by the participant that asked that question. Okay. Um, this slide is, uh, you know, number five is teach them the 8D. The customer, in many cases, wants an 8D. They want, a, you know, they do want some documentation. You can call it an A3 or whatever, but, you know, many cases, I've taught teams this first. It's like there's an 8D process. You know, sometimes I say it's soup to nuts. Sometimes, that, you know, it's from the start to finish. This is problem solving. We The problem's identified. Houston, we got a problem to... You know, President Nixon congratulating, you know, the astronauts are safely back home. But congratulations. How do you go from the problem to the end? You know, you know, what are we doing right now for containment? What We're looking for cause. We're not looking for a solution. We're looking for a cause. We'll get to the solution in D5. We'll implement the solution in D6. We'll look at the controls and think beyond the fix in D7 and the prevention, and then we'll congratulate the teams. So it's just a simple one. We start with this and, uh, you know, let people understand what an 8D is. And this is people on the floor. Uh, they many times they know what containment is because, you know, you're checking, a, you know, you're putting a china marker or a, a paint pen on a part that has a loose bolt. Now they're, you know, a containment company is doing, you know, GP12 or something. Uh, they know what containment is. But how do they help with the cause? How do they help with the solution? How do they help with implementation and controls? Um, so that's why it's important to treat, you know, to train them the AD as well. So it looks like we got another poll up here. Sam? All right. There's another it, yeah, poll there. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry, Joel. I'm sorry, Joel. I was on mute there. Um, yes, this poll question is our second and final poll question. Currently, what problem-solving methods do you teach your teams? And you can see your choices are five-wise, fishbone, sigma, lean, kaizen, other, or none. 
So what I'd like to do is open it up for the audience, um, and we can uh, – I'm trying to get – I'm trying to get that opened up, folks, for the audience on this particular question. Okay, great. I'm sorry, folks. Here's the question, and and I'd like you to start voting now with what problem-solving method do you teach your teams? Uh, You've got 60 seconds to decide which one of those you would prefer well which one do you use 100 percent wishbone <laughs> oh there we go <laughs> and we've got 30 seconds left to complete your answers Okay, five more seconds, please. Okay, I'm going to stop the voting now. And you can see with the data, what we actually ended up with, Joel, was the five white fishbone very heavily at 68% as the current problem solving methodology that is taught to the frontline teams, 58%. 2% Sigma, 20% Lean Kaizen, 9% Other, and 9% None. So, Joel, you may want to speak to that data a little bit. Yeah, I, I kind of uh, assume most folks would train five wise. I think that's a very good place to start. Um, you know, Other, I would think that KT would be included in there or Shannon or, you know, some type of RCA root cause analysis of some sort. Um yeah, I think Sigma is probably not trained to the uh, frontline team, um, but other, you know, throughout your team. And that's why it's important to, you know, uh, if you, what you're training to your team is what would you train on your frontline? It's kind of a broad question. Uh, clearly, we want people to ask, you know, the five whys or more and, you know, why something happened. Uh, but, again, the the one that's, you know, the, the 9% that's none, um yeah, I think that's, uh, you know, internally relook at, you know, I, maybe I do want to train my teams and help them uh, go forward a little bit. Um, and that's really, uh, you know, a little bit of my philosophy was number six here, you know, was not only do I train them so they learn, the best way to prove that they learned it is, you know, for them to do it. Um, my recent example, you know, uh, we needed some red rabbits, new red rabbits. So, you know, the posting on the board was we need new, new red rabbits. The new way is, you know, it's, and it's basically just a question, you know, okay, we need new red rabbits. What are what are we going to do about that? And sometimes you get, you know, and sometimes they even put the you in there. What are you going to do about it? And the back, it's like, huh? Well, yeah, I mean, it's easy to say we need new red rabbits. How are you going to take that and step toward a solution. And believe it or not, the frontline team is willing to help stepping toward a solution, coming up with cause, stepping toward a solution, just like an AD. And uh, many times you'd be, you know, I I use, I I don't know exactly whose analogy it is, but ducks in the duck pond, you know, you hear quack, 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 quack. We need new red rabbits. We need this new, this machine needs to be fixed. Quack, quack, quack. It's like, well, you know, how do you get them to soar? What are we going to do about this? Practice asking and saying that, you know, what are you going to do about it? What can you do about it? What should we do about it? And get them involved. And you'd be surprised how many uh, how many people respond positively. Uh, number seven for me is you need to explain the power of questions. Uh, I use many examples. I use one in a decision. I'm going to use it here. Is, uh, you know, hey, I, you know, I need to buy a new car. It's like, well, you already funneled down to that decision. I need to buy a new car. If you go up, you know, it's like, well, you know, why did you choose a car? It could have been a truck. It could have been a bike. It could have been a skateboard. It could have been a balloon. Who knows, right? 
or it could have been way up at the top. I need, you know, I need a mode of transportation. Or you start to narrow down. It's like, well, why did you want to buy one? Why don't I just steal one? Or why don't I lease one? Or why don't I borrow one? Or why don't I beg for one? And why, you know, why do you have to buy it? What, you know, uh, maybe, you know, it, you know, it, there's many, many other ways to get people to that decision, to that that problem, if they ask the right questions. Of course, if you keep asking the questions and keep narrowing it down, you get to, I need to buy a, a used four-wheel drive Ford SUV that's red. Well, now you've narrowed it down so much that it's like the decision's easy. And these right questions we teach in, you know, when we're teaching Kepner Trago, these same right questions narrow the choice down. And in problem solving, the right questions, the right narrowing down, helps to solving the problem, finding the cause, just like uh, in a decision, the right questions. So here's here's a real-life example, number eight. You have to come up with real-life examples because you want to relate people to what has happened. Um, I start with one like Houston. We have a problem. Um, you know, everyone remembers Apollo 13. And, and it's like, hey, what's the problem? They could have said we're losing electricity. But as soon as they say we're losing electricity on bus bar B, then what goes in your, off in your mind is like, hey, why aren't we losing electricity on bus bar A? That is, that is thought-provoking. And, uh, you know, another one was, hey, we, we make, we mold these overhead councils, and there's black specks in the tan overhead council, and we mold tan gray and black, you know, and, and it's easy, well, you're, you know, you molded the tan after the black. Well, and, you know, that's why you got the black specks. But the right question is, is like, well, what evidence do you have that they're black? And, and what do you mean it's black? You look. Well, that's it? You want me to just look? I mean, there's no evidence of what black means. It gets people thinking to a different level. Maybe it's a dark, dark red. And, uh, you know, it's not black at all. And in this case, uh, it was actually clear. But, you know, yeah, the right questions provoke the right, you know, thought process. Oops. Um, so high-performance teams, you know, they need to be asked, and taught how to question. Um, we need to make weld adjustments. Is that a good problem statement? I mean, a better problem statement is, you know, uh, why is the robot out of adjustment that's actually bringing the welder to, you know, or why is weld 13 the one that needs to be adjusted? Those are better problem statements uh, and better questions rather than, oh, it's the system. Or it, we need to make weld adjustments. We got to get the people to get very specific, and we help them with that. And number nine, you have to help them with the problem statements. And so I actually backed up into problem statements, like you know we got a problem. There's you know some of my uh, old pictures are ruined on my basement floor. Why? Well, because water leaked out of the water here. Oh, so you know why? Yep. So why did it leak out? Well, it it overheated, right? Why did it overheat? Her? Oh, why did it overheat? I don't know. Oh, let's. That's the problem. So many times you ask questions and and find the causes, and you back up until the cause is unknown, and then that's the problem you work on. And this takes practice. There's there's no doubt about it. it. Takes practice, but we taught people to back up to get a good problem statement. I think many times people understand that you know a bad a, a good problem statement is like eighty percent of the of the problem solved. So in this example, this is a real example we taught, uh, you know, our Titan XM180 water heater was, was leaking, right? It was actually the one that was overheating, and it leaked. And, you know, oh, so that is, do other Titan 180s leak? No. Oh, ours leaks. Why does ours leak and not other ones? And that's the is, is not. And people, well, they got to think about that. Well, I don't know. I mean, it, it shouldn't leak. It's the same. I mean, ours was maybe modified by a plumber to get in the room, but, you know, that shouldn't be any reason uh, to leak. And then you like to rephrase the questions. Let me get this straight. Our water heater was modified, and it leaks, and all the other ones that weren't modified don't leak. It's like, yeah, maybe I, maybe I need to, to see what was modified. And you get people answering and asking those questions and, and really go deeper. And that's really number 10, you know, you need to go deeper 
to get to these good problem statements, um, you know, you want to specify the problem and then the action. I have a bent rail example here. This is a real life example. Um, the, the team, the customer called up, they had a bent rail. And the, one of the questions is, okay, what do you mean by bent? Because everyone, everyone has a different, you know, understanding of what bent is. And as it turned out, this rail was actually twisted. And it was twisted seven degrees. And now the team was looking for, wow, what could twist our rail seven degrees? That's a whole lot different than starting off with, oh, it's bent. And, and the questions need to go deeper and specify the problem, and our teams did this. And then uh, number 11, uh, which is probably one of my favorites, you, you, you need to go faster. The teams need to fail faster to succeed sooner. Um, give them the disciplines of problem solving in their toolbox. Increase their problem solving proficiency. They ask for harder and more complicated issues to solve, especially when they have some wins. Drive urgency, and in some cases, set up a DOE, set up a trial. It's very easy to set up a trial. Lately, I've been making a couple things out of wood rather than steel just to try it. I made things out of plastic rather than aluminum. Let's try it, see if it fits, see if it works. Um, there's many things you can do. Fail faster to succeed sooner. Uh, I think that's a, to me, that's one of my uh, favorite sayings. And then finally, number 12, um, this isn't everybody gets a trophy. You know how teams play soccer and everybody wins. You know, it's like, well, why do you even have goals? That, you know, why do you even have nets? Uh, not everybody should get a trophy. It's earned recognition. This is problem solving. This is helping them in life. Um, you know, this isn't a handout. This isn't a freebie. This is you give up your lunchtime, you work hard, you solve problems, I'm going to give you homework, I'm going to reward you if you move the needle. And so we created a practitioner certificate. They really had to apply. They had to track the projects. Um, and if they won, as a high-performance team would, then we, we recognize them with, you know, a certificate, with a trophy. Um, of course, we always encourage them along the way, and we provide help and mentorship, um, but that doesn't mean they get a trophy until they succeed. You don't want to dampen the success here. This is life-changing in many. You want to change, you know, their pathway. You want to change where they're on. They're on the shop floor for a reason. In some cases, they want to change that. And you have you you can give them the reasons to change, and you can give them the tools to change. And actually, that's number twelve. And uh, Sam, based on that, I think uh, we have a little time for some questions. And uh, yeah, there's thanks. our contact information. Thanks very much, Joel. I think we have about five minutes for questions. I've got some from our participants. I'm going to jump right into those. And uh, if you could go back to slide thirty-two, Joel. Uh, quickly, yeah. one of the questions yeah. came up around slide 32. Um, I got it. When you look at those bullets, thank you, it says, have your team ask the correct critical question and know when not to leave the question until the accurate answer is received. I know uh, from working with you, you felt KT is really good at giving clients incisive questioning skills. Can you just talk briefly more about what you mean by the correct critical question or incisive questions as you've shared with me in the past? Yeah, and I think this is a, I mean, the correct critical questions, I think people do have an opportunity to know the answer before they ask it. Um, and it's not actually the specific answer, but if, if, you know, someone says, hey, you know, the copier is broke. Oh, okay, the copiers, okay, well, I guess we got to get it fixed. Wait a minute, what do you mean by broken, you know? I mean, is it, you know, is, is it not taking a picture? Is the paper not coming out? And and so, I mean, our teams have really, you have to, you have to start understanding these critical questions. Like, don't leave until you feel satisfied. And like a copier broken, well, it, it's broke. I mean, you know, the the image is real light. Oh, as as compared to what? And this is kind of the is not. Well, as compared to real dark or, or how it should be, you know, or it's is it, you know, the upper corner is just real light or real faded. And you'd be surprised how many times, you know, 
people don't ask these questions. I had a real life example, you know, my daughter's car wouldn't start. Oh, okay. And some people say she needs a jump, right? And she wondered if I had cables. It's like, you know, well, wait a minute. When you say it doesn't start, what do you mean? Because it, it could be out of gas and then it, it turns over and turns over and turns over, but it doesn't have any gas or it doesn't turn over at all or it turns over real slow. And in her case, it, it didn't turn over at all, but yet there was electricity going to everything else. And so it's like, oh, so now what you're saying is is you, everything else gets electricity, but your starter, when you turn the key, doesn't get electricity. Is that correct? And Yeah, that's correct. It, you know, Or someone says, ah, my engine's running rough. Well, what do you mean your engine is running rough? Well, it's running on like one cylinder. Oh, you, you already, I did an analysis, it's on one. It appears it's not getting fuel. Oh, so you know, on one cylinder. So what you're saying is is that one cylinder isn't getting fuel as compared to the other one. And you learn that it's a, you know, critical question. Like, well, what kind of engine is it? Is it a two-cycle or a four-cycle? It has valves or it has ports. These are the things that you can't leave it alone. And I mentioned the bent rail. What do you mean by bent? Oh, well, it, you know, bent. It's, uh, you know, and then all of a sudden you find out it's like, well, it's actually the left-hand one and it's the front part of the left-hand one and it's twisted seven degrees that's a much better answer than it's bent joel, joel thanks for those detailed examples i think we have time for one more question uh from one of the participants but it's kind of like two questions in one and then we'll wrap things up but the question is when you talk about the high performance team could you define quickly how large or small those teams should be and maybe what some of the functions of those frontline employees would consist of. And then when you work with these high-performance teams with problem-solving tools such as KT or other tools, do you require them to do anything, you know, in between your training sessions or application or homework opportunities? Let me answer the, uh, the second question first. Thanks, Sam. Do I require homework? Absolutely. They absolutely always, they have to have homework. They have to do more things on their time with the, with the Internet. They can research things. They can learn about things. Uh, we had problems with an electrical instrument. It's like, okay, learn about the electrical instrument. Gather this knowledge so you can talk. Uh, you do need sometimes subject matter experts. So there's always homework. There's always a form to fill out in many cases, you know, a, 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 you know, chicken scratches, is, is not specified the problem. And then back to your other question, how how big of a team or large the high-performance team should be? Um, we we generally have teams, you know, 10 to 15, you know, sometimes a little smaller. Right now I have a team like 17, but, um, you know, th there, there has to be specific roles, and that kind of generates the team. So, you know, you have like a quality person, you have a manufacturing person, you know, more response. You have a maintenance person responsibility. You have a 5S person. It's easy to kind of divide up roles. And um, that's what that kind of, you know, if you had 100 people, they're all not going to be the quality people. They're all not going to be the quality lead. You know, so you want to have a smaller team and that gives them specific roles, that gives them specific leadership positions, and then they can be responsible for that. So, like, you know, the information person or the, you know, the root cause person can make sure they fill out the KT state and specify form. Everyone needs to have a role. Everyone needs to have homework. And uh, the more you do that and put it up on the board and, and you know, people get it done on time, that's an attaboy and, a, and an opportunity for a reward. So. So, so it sounds like you're a big proponent of cross-functional skills and cross-functional teams. Absolutely. You need high diversity. People come from different backgrounds and you want to tap into it and tap into their different way of thinking. And uh, I want to train them the skills um, to be better using the talent that they already have, but, you know, help them gain more talent and then become more valuable in the workplace and uh, get raises and bonuses and recognition. Joel, thank you very much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, to close this session out and move you along on a timely basis to your next uh, activities we just want you to know that we take these sessions very seriously and we're very interested to know if you found this valuable we would ask that you please rate this session using the rate this button on your console and uh, better yet uh, feel free to reach out to joel 
or me, Joel, maybe you can advance the slide again to our contact information. Uh, Joel's email address is on there. My email address is on there. Um, you'll you'll see that uh, with, uh, uh, I think Joel's trying to find that slide now. I think it's the next to last oh, slide. Look. Oh, there it is. And um, just wanted you folks to know that uh, we will, as we promised, follow this up through email with a recorded copy of this presentation, as well as um, an opportunity for you to see the PowerPoint slides and the audio. Encourage you to share that with your colleagues. And again, feel free to reach out to Joel or me personally uh, through email. Glad to answer any of your questions, or if you even want us to call you, give us a number and we'll follow up with you personally. So sensitive to time, on behalf of Joel and myself and everyone at Kepner Trago, thanks very much for your time this afternoon, this morning, this evening, wherever you're at. Uh, we wish you a very good uh, balance of the day, and thanks very much. Hope to hear from you sometime soon. Bye-bye. Thanks, Anthony.